Welcome to our Luke Bible class. Glad that you're tuned in with us on this video recording of our class. And uh, today we're going to begin or we're going to continue our methodical progression through the Gospel of Luke. And today we're going to begin in verse 54 of Luke chapter 12. Uh, continue through verse 17 of chapter 13, 1254 through 13. 17. Now, before we get into our study today, I just want to quickly mention a couple of things. Uh, one is I'm working on a, a way for us to be able to, as a class, to ask questions or to discuss the things that we're studying, which up to now this venue just doesn't really allow for that. So at the end of the video today, I will give you some instructions about how we can participate together in a video, video conferencing setting. So, uh, more technology. Now, as my class knows, I have a lot of luck with technology. Most of it bad, but anyhow, we, we keep trying. And so, anyway, at the end of class, uh, I'll give some instructions there uh, for us to be able to participate together in uh, kind of a follow-up to this class session. So let's let's begin. We have as, our procedures the same as we've been doing. We're going to look at each of these sections uh, contained in, in this range of scriptures to talk about them a little bit. Come back then and go back through and try to get a feel for how Luke is presenting his case for Jesus. Uh, we've used the analogy in this class of the forest and the trees, and we know that we're familiar with the, the saying, I can't see the forest for the trees. And the, the thought there is, or at least the way we're using it is, you know, there is value in studying an individual tree. Uh, and you can, you can, man, you can get into some minute detail in studying all about that tree. But what if that tree is a part of a forest? Well, you, you've got to step back and you've got to look at the larger picture and, and the role that that tree plays uh, in the bigger picture and its relationship to other trees and that, that kind of thing. And historically, I think we have done more tree studies than we have done forest studies. We have done a lot more of we look at the like we're going to start in verse 54 here of chapter 12 and uh, that will carry over to verse 56 and so we'd study that little section all by itself in isolation what does it mean what's going on here those kinds of things there's value and worth in that kind of study and we need to do that kind of study but what we're wanting to do is okay well, how does that then fit in with everything else that's going on that Luke's telling us about? So that's, that's our continued approach in our study. So let's begin here in verse 54 of chapter 12. <clears throat> he also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, A shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, There will be a scorching heat. And so it happens. Uh, they are people just like us. We, you know, we have sayings like red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Uh, we're able to look at what's going on around us and anticipate what's coming, to, to interpret those things. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. You, you people do that. But then he adds this, you hypocrites, you know how to, uh, to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? You're, you're good at interpreting these weather signals, these signs that you observe on the earth and in the heavens uh, about what's going to happen in this natural world. But, man, what is happening right in front of your eyes right now from a spiritual perspective? Are the very things that have been prophesied for generations previous, uh, these great works and miracles that Jesus is doing, there is being something shown to you that should be obvious to you, but you're missing it. And so you're not interpreting the times in which you're living. Uh, like I said, we're going to note what's said here. 
We're going to come back to these things here in just a few moments. That then is followed by these words beginning in verse 57 and going through the rest of chapter 12 to verse 59. Why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? You go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. I believe what Jesus is encouraging his followers here is you need to, you, you see those, those disagreements, those, those differences that exist in your life between yourself and somebody else. Don't, don't just let those things go. You need to address those. You need to do your best to make things right there in those relationships now because the chances of that going on and, and developing in, into something that's far worse than, than what you're experiencing now they're pretty great. And so don't allow that to happen. You need to tend to these things and do so in a very timely manner. Uh, settle with your accuser before you ever get to the judge. And so that's Jesus' uh, encouragement to his disciples. Uh, this, this reminds us that in all that we've been studying and reading about here in Jesus' ministry, his teaching and his preaching and his instruction to his followers, there are, I mean, we get down to some pretty basic, granular, pragmatic, practical points about just how you conduct your life on an everyday level. And, and this is one of those times, this is one of those instructions and teachings from Jesus that kind of fits into that category. So, chapter 13 then begins. Uh, first five verses. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So, Jesus, it's brought to Jesus' attention uh, this, this tragic event of some Galileans who apparently had come to Jerusalem for the purpose of offering sacrifices, and we're not told the reason why, but Pilate ends up having these individuals killed. Now, Pilate was a ruthless individual. Uh, he, uh, I don't know how else to say that. So this is very much in line with his character that he would treat people in this way. But the point that's being made here is that, okay, we have this tragic event and something horrible has befallen these Galileans. So how do you interpret that? Do you interpret that as they received God's judgment, that they had done something wrong, and therefore that's why they came to this end? Uh, and then he adds to that, or what about another tragedy in which a wall fell, this wall at the Tower of Siloam, and there were 18 people who were killed in that tragedy? So how do you interpret that? Do you interpret that as, okay, well, these people must have been particularly bad, they must have been sinful people, and that's why these bad things happened to them. And Jesus shoots that kind of thinking down. Uh, now, that kind of thinking is very common today, uh, and it has been very common all the way back through human history and throughout Scripture. That kind of thinking, for instance, is what's at play in the book of Job when Job is suffering terribly. And you remember his three friends say, well, Job, if you're suffering terribly, just like the Galileans and these 18 who were killed suffered terribly, if you're suffering terribly, that must mean that you've done something wrong. And therefore, you're needing to repent. And the degree of your suffering, which was great, uh, demands great repentance on your part. And Job maintained, I have done nothing wrong. And of course, it turns out, as we know, uh, they were incorrect about this, and Job was correct. It's that same line of thinking that Jesus is dealing with here. And, and we see that kind of thinking still today. 
every time there's a tragedy, just like what we're going through right now, it is not unusual at all to hear people interpreting this as, well, this is God's judgment against whoever, America, the Italians, uh, the Chinese, whatever. And so it's interpreted in terms of, okay, you have this terrible consequence that must have been preceded by terrible sin. That's why the consequence has happened. That's not how things work. Now, it is true that sometimes we can do things that are wrong and bad and sinful and there are bad consequences that follow. But sometimes there are just tragedies. Sometimes there are bad things that happen to no fault of the person who is affected by them. And so Jesus is, is dealing with that very line of thought, that kind of thinking here. But then he takes it a step further. He says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And, and, and he says that twice here. And so Jesus says there is a way to look at these tragedies and these difficulties and these hardships that, that come into our human existence, unfortunately, fairly regularly. We need to remember that unless we do repent, and that's been the message all along, hasn't it? John the Baptist came preaching a repentance, uh, calling people to repentance. Jesus came preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message the primary message that is being delivered is that humanity needs to repent. And Jesus says, if we don't repent, there is bad that's coming. So when, when you see these tragic events and, and bad things are befalling people, may that be a reminder to you. A reminder that there is a time coming in which those who have failed to repent and turn to God and obey Him and receive His grace, His salvation, there's going to be a time when there are going to be horrible consequences that will have to be paid. And so Jesus says, okay, these things happen. May they remind us of that and cause us and motivate us then to be ones who ought to repent. Let's keep going. Starting in verse 6. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it, put on manure, and then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So, the owner of the vineyard uh, is in anticipation that this fig tree is going to produce fruit. It's going to, he's going to gain benefit from it. But consistently, it's failing to produce. And so he says, I've had enough. Let's just cut it down and get rid of it. But the, but the vine dresser, the keeper of the vineyard, says, let's give it a little more time. Let's cultivate it. Let's work with it. Let's, let's give it a year. And then at that time, if it's still not producing, then we cut it down. I think the message here is that humanity has failed in regard to its creator, his creator, God. And we all stand worthy to be judged and condemned, cut down, as it were. But we still have opportunity, just like this tree was going to have another opportunity. It's going to have another year. It's going to be cultivated. It's going to be worked with. We have opportunity for us to produce, kind of interesting, it just, this thought just popped in my mind. Remember, John preached that people should bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Well, we're given the opportunity to bear fruit, staying with the fig tree idea here. Uh, fruit worthy of repentance. But that opportunity is not limitless. There's going to come a time when there will be an accounting. And so just like this tree was given another year, so we are given the opportunity as long as we live and the Lord hasn't returned. That's our opportunity 
but we do need to repent. So that, in that sense, this ties into just the, the previous that we looked at just, just a moment ago. Okay, the last section we need to look at here uh, begins in verse 10 and goes through verse 17 here in chapter 13. Uh, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, okay? That's been typical of Jesus' MO, his mode of operation. Uh, we've seen this. It's been a little while since we've run across this, but this is certainly not the first time that Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years, and she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Jesus saw her and called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and said to the people, There are six days in which uh, work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan uh, bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And he said these things. As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glories, uh, rather glorious things, that were done by him. Well, there are several things at play here in, in this uh, little section. Uh, one, obviously, is the fact that Jesus in the synagogue again casts out a demon. He has done it numerous times previously. It seems to have been a, a major feature, uh, if, if we're able to judge according to what the gospel accounts tell us about the things that Jesus did. Casting out demons seemed to have been a major feature of his ministry, and so he cast this demon out of this woman, which has caused her to be doubled. Uh, she's bent over, and this has been the case for 18 years. But Jesus is able to immediately heal her. So uh, what's been a problem for 18 years is instantaneously fixed by Jesus and the response to that miracle is that the ruler of the synagogue, now this is not the first time we've run into a ruler of the synagogue, uh, this would have been a person who would be considered to be a part of the Jewish religious establishment. Um, but a previous ruler of the synagogue was Jairus. Remember him, his daughter, Jesus healed his, or raised his daughter from the dead. Jairus came to him begging him to heal his daughter. Uh, who was near death. Uh, and so Jairus had a very favorable view toward Jesus. Uh, here we have a ruler of the synagogue who does not. And Jesus seizes on this opportunity. And, and I guess that's probably why Luke chooses to record this particular miracle and the aftermath of this miracle, because this man is critical of Jesus for healing on the Sabbath day. And this becomes an opportunity for Jesus to expose the failure of the approach to faith and religion that was practiced and promoted by the Jewish establishment, by the ruler of the synagogue, scribes, Pharisees, lawyers, Sadducees, the whole nine yards. And, and, and the point in that is this that they believed that their allegiance to God was best demonstrated by their strict adherence to the law of God. I mean, the more closely you can follow that law, then the closer you are to God. That's kind of, in essence, what they believed and, and practiced. Um, of course, we know that they had a lot of extra laws uh, in connection with keeping the Sabbath day because the Sabbath law was you, you do no work. Uh, you remember that day to keep it holy, and that's about as far as it went. Whereas they had gone to great lengths to talk about all of these things that you could not do, but Jesus' healing 
this man saw as a violation of the Sabbath. And this isn't the first time that kind of accusation has been made against Jesus. And what Jesus demonstrates here and teaches us is that our allegiance to God is not best demonstrated. I'm being careful about how I say this. Our allegiance to God is not best demonstrated by how strictly we're able to obey Him, but rather how much we are able to be like Him. Here was this woman who was in a horrible condition, and, and this ruler of the synagogue had more concern for keeping the Sabbath than he had for the fact that this woman was able to be healed of this very debilitating condition. Jesus had compassion and love for this woman and moved in such a way so she was able to be delivered from it and to be healed of it and this evil spirit cast out. Uh, and so the failure here is that these people, and already said this, <laughs> I'm going to say it again, that these people believed that their allegiance to God and their closeness to God was best demonstrated by their strict obedience to His Word as opposed to their being God-like. And that's a, that's a great difference. And it's, it's not an either-or situation, but they had put the one nearly to the exclusion of the other. And Jesus never does suggest to us that we should not be concerned with obeying God's Word. We should and we must. But we need to recognize that what is most important are things that are godly. And, and Jesus used this opportunity to expose this bankrupt approach to faith and religion. Now, as a consequence of all this, it says in verse 17 that his adversaries were put to shame, but the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Uh, interesting responses here. The adversaries are put to shame. They are shamed because their failure uh, is exposed. They are shown for what they truly are. Uh, even though they are a people who typically, again, like the Pharisees and others, were admired and respected. But Jesus said, no, you, you're hypocrites. You're hypocrites because you're willing to do good for your own animals, your, your donkey, your oxen. You do good for them, even on the Sabbath day. And here is a fellow descendant of Abraham. She's a daughter of Abraham. And yet you're upset when she is delivered from this. Um, and yet you, you don't want good to be done for her, but you do good for your animals. That's hypocritical. That is hypocritical. And Jesus calls them out on that. And so they are shamed in the eyes of the people. Now, you know that didn't go over very well. Uh, we've talked before in this class about the opposition to Jesus, their adversarial relationship was fueled by their jealousy of him because these folks were shamed while all the people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. Now that's a positive response to what Jesus has done. They're, they're happy, they're glad about this, as they should be. But I think it should also be observed that it's one thing to, to be glad and happy, to rejoice over all the great things that Jesus was able to do, but then to respond to him in the way that he wants, wants us to respond. Could they rejoice at all that Jesus was doing and yet fail to follow him as they ought to follow him? I think the answer to that is yes. That, that's obviously the case. So um, you have a bad response and you have a good response but there is a best response, and, and we don't see that here. And I think that's just worthy of, of noting. So, I, I want us to go back, and let's kind of go back through this quickly as we think about 
some of these themes in Luke's gospel that he has been developing along the way and how some of these things fall into those themes. And so uh, we, begun, we begin with your failure to interpret the times. Uh, the Son of God is here in your midst, and that is being shown to you. You might remember that um, back in verse 29 of chapter 11. I'm going to turn back there here real quick. Uh, there was this generation who was looking for a sign, and Jesus described it as an evil generation. He says, there will be no sign given you but the sign of Jonah. There are some things that you should be seeing and you should be understanding, but you're not, you're not getting it back in verse 20 of chapter 11, uh, at, on the occasion when Jesus was accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul. Remember that? Uh, he says, in, in, part of his response to that was, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. So, <laughs> if you see that, and they were seeing it, and you understand it appropriately that this is being accomplished, this casting out of demons is being accomplished by the power of God, the finger of God, then no, that signifies something to you that His kingdom is upon you. You need to be understanding these things, and yet they were failing to understand these things. Now, I, I, I do not want to, but get into the a whole discussion of the signs of the times. Um, you know, there's a lot of religious discussion that goes on right now about the signs of the end of times and that certain things are happening. And, and there are some people who are looking at this very coronavirus situation and trying to make it into a sign of the times, of the end of the coming of Christ and those kinds of things. It's not that that's not a, a subject that's worth considering, but that's not what's being discussed here. Look around you and see what's going on and understand that. Now, for these people, that was the very appearance of the Son of God in your presence. I think an application for us is, is that we can get so caught up in our day-to-day -day routines and, and, and just going through the motions of what we do all the time, do it every day, all year long, and we fail to be observant of what's really going on around us. And we need to have eyes that are open, open to our opportunities for service, open to our opportunities to share the gospel. And this is certainly uh, one of those occasions in which we need to have eyes opened to. These are different times for us, aren't they? Well, let's, let's understand them in light of the Word of God and how we ought to respond to them. Uh, you go on. Uh, we already talked about the settling with your accuser and how sometimes the teaching of Jesus just really gets down to the nitty-gritty. And uh, may we be motivated and encouraged to make the relationships in our life right if we know there's someone who has something against us or maybe we have something against somebody else. The time to deal with that is now. Uh, it can only worsen if you just let it go. The need for uh, repentance. Uh, let's, let's not fall into the same trap that people of Jesus' day, uh, people of Job's day, and people today fall into. That uh, bad things happen. The, the only reason bad things happen is because people have done things wrong. No, bad things happen because that's the nature of this life, this fallen world in which Satan is allowed to function and operate. Uh, there are bad things that happen, and we have to deal with them. We have to face them. Uh, we, sometimes we can't find an explanation for it, but they just do happen. It's not because God's mad at us. It's not because that he's displeased with us. That is not the right interpretation at all. But as he says here, at the same time, we do look at some, some bad things that are happening in our world right now. And that should serve as that reminder to us that there's a time coming in which unless we 
repent, unless we give our lives over in full submission and obedience to God, that there is a price to be paid, and it's a severe price. And so uh, we, we do need to repent. The parable of the barren fig tree, uh, we have opportunity right now, and let, let's not forget that and recognize that that opportunity is not endless. There is going to come a time when we will have no more opportunities and, and the price will have to be paid. And so opportunity is ours. Let's take full advantage of that. Uh, when we think about this woman with the disabling spirit and Jesus casting out that, that demon, uh, you, you know, you see again the authority of Jesus demonstrated over what man has had no ability to deal with or uh, to to overcome to have authority over himself but but he does Jesus does these demons they were no match for Jesus he would just say the word and they would do whatever he said to do and so he obviously is someone who is unlike anybody or anything else anyone has ever seen before take note of that recognize that he is one to be a paid attention to. Another thing that we see here uh, very visibly demonstrated is that Jesus, the Son of God, enters into human life. He enters into this world, and it's a world characterized by sin and sorrow and darkness and pain and suffering. And this woman is a demonstration of that. She is physically bent over double. And yet, what is the words that are used for Jesus' interaction with her is she was able to straighten up. She was made straight. Jesus has come to make straight what has been twisted and perverted and bent and damaged and destroyed. He's able to make it right. He The, the, the term is used here that she has been freed. She has been bound and oppressed by this spirit, by Satan, and Jesus has come to free. That is what Jesus appearance in this world is showing us. Look at what he's able to do and what he has come to do and what ultimately he is able to accomplish for us. And of course, the last thing here is that we need to take care not to get caught up in the same kind of an approach to faith and religion that these folks have gotten caught up in. I'll, I'll just be uh, kind of frank about this. Uh, you know, churches like Center Hill and others have, have made the decision that in this given circumstance, it is not best for the church to gather together on Sunday. That decision is made not because we don't feel like it's important. It's obviously important to us. It would take extenuating circumstances, severe extenuating circumstances for us to, for that kind of a decision to be made. Well, these are severe extenuating circumstances, wouldn't you say? And there have been those who have refused to not assemble. And they have done so saying, well, you know, God says to assemble, we're going to assemble, and you can't tell us to do otherwise. It certainly is not in the best interest of those people to be together in that kind of proximity uh, like that in the name of obeying God. It was not in the best interest of this woman for Jesus to not heal her in, in the name of keeping the Sabbath. Her need and her situation superseded what was, the, what was the law of God that you keep the Sabbath, but in doing what Jesus did, he did not violate the Sabbath. He violated their interpretation of what it meant to keep the Sabbath. And so we have to recognize that, uh, again, I'm going to say it again. I've already said it more than once. But our allegiance to God is best demonstrated. From God's perspective, it is best demonstrated not in the strictness of our obedience to Him. It's not best demonstrated that way. It is best demonstrated in us becoming like God, people of compassion and mercy that, that are concerned for the people around us and act to help them to the very best of our abilities. Now, again, it's not an either-or, but there is one that 
is above the other, and we need not forget that. Well, uh, our next class uh, today was class number seven, and I'm numbering these so for, why, if, for whatever reason people want to go back and kind of follow through in order. Uh, the numerical order is obviously the easiest. And so this has been class number seven. Our next class, which will be available on Sunday, will be class number eight, and we'll pick up in verse 18 of Luke 13 and continue through verse six of chapter 14. So 13 verse 18 through chapter 14 verse six. Now, uh, what I told you I would tell you here at the end of class uh, obviously, you're not able to ask questions or make observations in this kind of a format. Uh, we're not even able to actually even see each other. So what I want to offer to you is an opportunity to be a part of a live video conferencing session. I plan on this taking place tomorrow night, which is Thursday, March the 26th. Uh, I want to make sure to clarify that for those who may be watching this at a later time. But tomorrow night, March the 26th at 7 p.m., we'll have this video conferencing where uh, we can get together. You can hear me, and I can hear you, and I can see you, and you can see me, and you can see whoever else is a part of this video conferencing. So understand that, uh, that if you participate, that others will be able to see you. So, you know, you might want to change out of those pajamas you've been wearing 24-7 here for the last few days. Well, maybe not. But anyhow, um, just know that, that people will be able to see you and hear you if you speak up. But if you have any questions, you have observations, uh, things that you would like to add to what we've been talking about, and not just in this session, but perhaps in previous sessions, then here's what I would like for you to do send me an email just telling me that you want to be a part of this video conferencing class. And then I will send back to you by email a link and then you can just click on that link and it will take you to this video conference. Now it's through the Zoom program. Some of you may be familiar with that. Some of you may not. It doesn't matter. Uh, but if you click on the link, it will take you directly to what Zoom calls a meeting, so our meeting tomorrow night. <clears throat> and you'll have to indicate to activate your device's camera and its microphone. You'll want to start the video so we can see you and you can see us and the, the microphone so we can hear you. And uh, we'll give you the opportunity then to, we'll have some, some back and forth uh, in, in that session. Uh, you might want to do this if you can, if you have a computer, a laptop, an iPad, uh, you can do it on an iPhone, but obviously the screen is small, and so whoever shows up on there, it's going to be a very small thing. If you have a bigger screen, then you'll be able to see folks a little better. If nothing else, it'll give you a chance to see some folks that you haven't been able to see for several days now. So send me an email, and I will reply to that email with the link to this meeting. And so you'll want to get it. We're going to start at seven o'clock. You might want, I'll get on that meeting uh, two or three minutes ahead of time. And it'll take us a little while, I guess, probably to make sure that everybody's set up and has their microphone on and their, their video working and all those kinds of things. But we'll see how this goes. Uh, if it works, then we'll do it again. Uh, but if not, then it was worth a shot. So anyway, uh, we hope to see you again uh, and as we continue this study of the Gospel of Luke, uh, continue, uh, continue in faithfulness to God. Keep washing your hands and uh, looking forward to the day that we can all be back together again. We'll see you then.